the agenda is said. Hello, everyone. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Today on the show, The Enemy Within. How do young people learn to hate their world so much that they will kill to show us? Young people radicalized right under our noses. That and more today. It's time to talk. The savage murder of a British soldier last week could have connections to the Boston Marathon bombing, both allegedly carried out by homegrown terrorists. Can Western societies stop this violence and reclaim the hearts of the young people? Well, you've heard the saying, the only certainties in life are death and taxes. Well, apparently the part about taxes does not always apply to big corporations. The CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, had to explain his light tax burden to U.S. lawmakers last week. Do huge companies have small tax bills because they're cheating, or is the tax system itself the problem? And what do these lawmakers here have to do to fix the situation? And people looking for a job who also have autism may want to put their medical condition on their resume. It could help to get them hired. The software giant SAP is now recruiting people with autism. The company says autistic employees have special talents needed in the computer and the IT world. Some people say it's a dividend in a disability. Well, I've invited three people today to talk, argue, and pry apart these headlines. My first guest says that his company is way ahead of SAP when it comes to seeing talent in autism. I am happy to welcome to the show Tillman Hufkin. He is with the Berlin company. Let me make sure I get this right. Tillman Aldicon, it is the first German company to exclusively employ autistic people as software testers, right? That's true. Um, you say autistic employees see things that others don't see. What is that? It is actually that um, autistic people obviously see things in patterns and that is different to I would say other people um, I wouldn't say normal people <laughs> okay but, but there is a difference we're going to talk about yeah. um, how SAP plans to cash in on this difference in just a moment my second guess says that there should be an even playing field in the corporate tax game I'm happy to welcome to the show Thomas Gamke he is a member of the German Parliament and he sits on its finance committee. Um, he is a vocal proponent of overhauling the tax systems in Germany and the European Union. Mr. Gamke, you want one corporate tax rate for all of Europe. Why would that, I mean, most people, of course, will laugh when they hear that because they think the chances of that happening are, are basically zero. But why do you think that would increase the tax revenues that countries get now, uh, get from corporations? Well, I think the main focus is not really on increasing the tax revenues. What we would like to have is really an equal level play playing field. So if we have these big differences in taxes, that offers companies, specific companies who can make use of these differences in corporate taxes, give them competitive um, value. Mm -hmm. And I think the competitions should be on the product, on the services we provide, but not really on the tax the basis they are working. All right, well, we're going to talk about the possibilities of changing the big monster tax systems in just a moment. And my next guest says that Muslim leaders need to put a gag on the messages of hate that are coming from within the religion. I'm happy to welcome to the show Usama Hassan. He is one of the UK's I think I can say one of the UK's most outspoken Muslim critics of Islamic extremism. Uh, Usama, you're a senior researcher at the Quilliam Foundation, which is dedicated to counter-terrorism. You're a part-time imam. You wear a lot of hats in the Muslim community. Um, you were also, I've read, a, a former jihadist. You went to Afghanistan to fight against the Soviets when they invaded. Um, you understand a lot of the anger that is being talked about right now. Are you placing the blame that we're seeing for, for all this violence and this hate, are you placing that with Islam and with your fellow Imams? I'm placing the blame on the extremist interpretation of Islam, uh, which are actually too common and dominant and heard around the world. The idea that Muslims cannot live in peace with non-Muslims, have non-Muslim friends, that we can't live in democratic 
liberal society that somehow democracy is opposed uh, to Islam because we must have God's law forced on earth and must live only in an Islamic state. These are very, very commonly held ideas right across the Muslim world. And that's what leads to young Western Muslim men mm -hmm. getting very angry about conflicts around the world and resorting to terrorism. Yeah, and I mean, the, the terrorism, of course, it shades you know, all of the discussions we're having. Um, it is difficult to, uh, to glean any good from the horrible killing of a British soldier that happened last week. The serviceman was run over and then hacked to death by two men who said that they killed him in the name of Islam. Well, since then, reports of anti-Islamic incidences in the UK have skyrocketed. It just seems like you've got more hate being placed upon hate. Well, today, we'd like to talk about what societies such as Britain and the US can do to tone down the noise that is creating groups of radicalized young people in our backyards. A soldier hacked to death in broad daylight on a London street. The suspects have a history of links to radical Islamic groups, but the authorities think the attack wasn't planned by a larger organization. A few weeks earlier, bombs at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Two brothers are blamed for the attack. Again, the authorities think they acted alone. U.S. President Barack Obama said in a recent speech that the threat from terrorism had shifted away from the kind of attack that hit America on September 11, 2001. After foreign wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and drone strikes in Pakistan, is it now homegrown terrorists acting alone that Western countries need to face? Osama, how has your work changed since the murder of that serviceman? We've had to uh, be more forceful about the, the problem of extremist interpretation of the Quran itself, which lead to a disconnect between many Muslims around the world and modern societies. So people think they can't live in peace with non-Muslims. They think they can import wars abroad, such as Afghanistan or Iraq, a war which I was opposed to. But uh, these people have clearly said that they're acting in the name of those wars and bringing the war back to Britain, which is why they attacked a British soldier, but didn't attack the civilian and passers-by. And where did the ideas come from that? Most of, most of the people that we're talking about are very young people. Um, they're impressionable. Most of them are, are young men. Um, who's giving them these ideas? There's a global ideology, actually. It's called Islamism, which is political Islam, excessively political Islam. And at its most violent end is Al-Qaeda. And when I was young, I was heavily influenced by this also, and I saw the world through the lens of Muslim versus non-Muslim. And it only needs to look at current events you have to look at. For me, 1982, the Sabra and Shatila massacres of Palestinian Muslims by Christian militia supported by Israelis. The 1995 massacre of 8,000 Muslim men and boys unarmed in Srebrenica in the, in the middle of Europe by uh, supposedly Christian armies. That has a massive radicalizing influence. And it's very easy to buy into the extremist preaching, which says this is a global war between Muslims and everybody else, and you have to become a soldier and take part in the jihad. This is what's happening to these young men when they l look at the images of, of wars around the world, and it's a problem which has to be dealt with. We have to stop the justification of this from Islamic scripture, which the extremists uh, carry out. What happened in your mind to, to change you? I mean, you say that you know, 20 years ago, if we had met, you, have, you would have been an extremist. Um, what happened in your life and in your mind to, to make you the person you are now? I was very fortunate that I was able to uh, experience more of life, uh, travel widely, uh, go to the best universities in Britain, uh, work in industry. Uh, become a father, having young children uh, had a big impact on me and then I realized that this idea of attacking civilians where often children are killed, as we saw in Boston, was deeply evil. And I had the benefit of, uh, of a religious scholarship background. I went deeper into the Quran, into the Islamic teaching, then I realized Islam is all about love and peace and mercy and the forgiveness uh, and love of God. That's the essential teachings. But it's very easy for angry preachers to pick on the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth passages and say we must have revenge, we must hit back against the West. Right, it, yeah, it is, and, and to see things as black and white, which, which we know the world is not um, black and white. Was there one point in your life, though, where you said, I have to change the way I think? Was there, was there like one catalyst, or was it more of a process? 
For me, it was a gradual process, but the 9-11 attacks were a major turning point and a catalyst. I, I did a lot of soul setting after that. And the main reason why, I'm ashamed to admit, I, along with thousands, perhaps millions of Muslims worldwide, actually celebrated the 9-11 attacks because we had built up so much hatred against what we saw as Western uh, power, Western colonialism, uh, Western imperialism, that uh, in revenge, as we saw it, for Sabra and Shatila in 1982, Sabra and in 1995, we somehow saw that 9-11 was a kind of revenge for that. But I realized in, my, in, in myself, this was actually deeply wrong. Yeah. And the soul searching led to a very rapid journey out of extremism. You know, I, I think too, I, I think we in the media, we, we tend to, to simplify things too. We tend to say that these extremists, um, that they are hell-bent on, on killing the other. But, but when I read your story, when I hear what you're saying, um, what you were doing even before you changed was something that, that was very analytical. You were looking at what was going on all over the world and you were trying to find patterns in it and you were trying to find um, causes and, and, and reactions. Um, do you think that's what's going on in the minds of the, these young men we see you know, in, in the UK or in the US who are committing these crimes? Are they thinking that far or are they just completely reactionary? No, there is a certain method to their madness uh, and they, are, they have a certain twisted logic. So the 7-7 seven, seven bombers in London, 05, who killed 50 odd people, their ringleader said in his suicide video, the martyrdom video, that this is a war, I'm a soldier, this is in response to the war in Iraq. If you kill our people, I'm going to kill your people. But, but and the disconnect there is our people for him should have been the British people, yeah. not the Iraqi people who had never met, had never been to Iraq. Same with the Woolwich attackers. Christian African background, radicalized perhaps in Kenya and, and Somalia, but uh, invoking the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, lands they've never been to. But, but, but explain to me then, how is it possible to grow up in the UK, to become a young man, and then not feel like you are British? I mean, is, is the, is, are the ghettos there so strong that your sense of identity is completely removed from everything around you? They are to some extent, yes. And a large part of this is social exclusion or racism. Growing up in 1980s Britain, it was a very racist society, actually. We encountered racism every day. And when you experience that against yourself, and especially your parents, I remember one point when my own mum was racially abused by a station ticket inspector. Uh, in front of me, I was probably seven or eight years old. Mm -hmm. That left a very deep impact. Sure. And we felt as though we were excluded from white British society. We were not welcome. And, and when you have inequality, unemployment, discrimination, you know, young black and Asian men across Europe still have high levels of unemployment and are more likely to be stopped by police and harassed. That is an explosive mix. And it is very easy for extremist preachers then to radicalize these people, prey on their vulnerabilities and say, this is not just about you and your color, this is about your religion worldwide. Right. Muslims are suffering everywhere. But you know, here, here this, this, is, this is my point of contention with you. I, I, I understand the criticisms about discrimination that, that you see in the public sphere. And a civil servant who discriminates against someone, that should be fired, I agree. But an imam is a leader in a, relig in a religion. How can anyone with any, any sense of, of, con of I don't know, a value for human life. How can they go into a mosque and preach hate and tell people that it is good if you go out on the streets and kill people who are different from you? Where, where, where is that thinking coming from? That thinking is coming from medieval approaches to scripture and law. This is the root cause of the problem. So the logic behind that thinking is jihad and war. Now, Muslim discourse has to catch up with modernity, with the 21st century. We have the Geneva Conventions, for example, to regulate war. But for the jihadists, they're still stuck in the revenge mentality, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and their identity is not as British or American citizens, it's as Muslims. So they say, if Muslims are attacked worldwide, we are going to hit back against non-Muslims. Against shouldn't, shouldn't we expect other enemies? Muslims in the UK to immediately come out and to nip that in the bud and to say, we will not allow our Imams to preach hate Shouldn't we expect that? Yes, and it's certainly happening. It's happening more and more. Uh, at Quilliam, we are perhaps the world's first counter-extremism think tank uh, set up five years ago, mainly because of the 07 bombings in London. Mm -hmm. We felt we had to challenge this. And it is in increasing this uh, counter-movement, counter-narrative from Muslims themselves, and we hope it will spread worldwide. We see a lot of hope. But uh, there are problems there in, in the sense that 
many Muslims worldwide share this idea of having to live in an Islamic state and you, and you must have enforcement of narrow Sharia law and etc. etc. They won't go as far as violence, but they still are sympathetic to some of those uh, grievances and ideas. And that also needs to be taken care of. Sure. But in terms of condemning the uh, violence and terrorism, that is uh, quite dominant now, but it doesn't change the mind of the young people, you see. Unless you deal with the, with the issue, people have been condemning the 9-11, uh, 7-7 bombings. We've had over a decade of terrorist attacks in the right. West. And young men are clearly still ready to kill themselves or, right. or, or, or attack people. So we have to deal with those ideas that they were at the source. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gonka, let me bring you into this. Um, when, when you hear what Usama is saying and, and what, what's coming out of the UK, um, does it ring true with, with what's going on in Germany? Well, not really, because uh, the, the discussion we had in the last couple of months actually coming from how is Germany reacting like we have this NSD, the, 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 the very right people. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we concentrate at the moment on, on the question, well, of course, how we can, in becoming a, an immigration country, you know, we, how, how we can... Um, bring people in the country and, 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 and live with them in, in, in a peaceful way, it is not as obvious as in other countries, like I consider that as being in, in the UK, um, the way how Muslims actually work and live here. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, I, I in, okay. In, in coming to the, the, the point, I'm, I'm the chairman of the ASEAN parliamentarian group, mm -hmm. so I am very frequently in the ASEAN states, from Indonesia, which is a Muslim country, to Malaysia, where we had, uh, and, and I'm personally uh, supporting uh, Ibrahim, uh, the, the the opposition leader. So my fear is that the the spark so to speak would 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 come over and and set uh, southeast asia in flames yeah yeah, yeah. 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 The, the rise of extremism so that yeah. would you know be even more impetus than i mean I, I i agree i mean i can understand that fear I, i'm just wondering yeah. living here yeah, you know sure. i i know it's <laughs> happened many times i've been in a taxi and the taxi car um the taxi driver is has lived here all his life yeah. but his parents are from turkey yeah. And I ask him, so um, are you German or Turkish? And mm -hmm. he always says either I'm Turkish or he says I don't know. <laughs> and that's always struck me. Why is that? Um, I said, you know, you see the same things I see, and I'm also a foreigner. Um, but why don't you feel like you belong? And he said, I've just never felt like the society I'm in now wants me. And... What has to happen for people to feel like they're, they're wanted? I mean, it's almost like it's almost as something as simple as you want your parents to let you know that they love you. And people grow up not feeling that from everything outside of their homes. I mean, what can change? I mean, I, that's why I think the work you do, um, Yusami, is so good because you are trying to change the narrative that all these young people hear all the time. Well, society does have to welcome immigrants and new people, strangers, and perhaps the American model there, because you're a young nation. Uh, I found in my visits to America and uh, discussions with European leaders, in 06 in Copenhagen there was a global meeting of young Muslim leaders, mm. half from Europe, half from the US, and all the European leaders listed integration as one of their top five issues for Muslims in Europe. And the American leaders uh, were staring at us saying, what are you talking about? They have no problem with integration. And I think this problem needs to be uh, nipped in the bud, as you say. And by the way, the extremist group which produced the Woolwich attackers yeah. uh, have spawned a couple of small groups in Germany who've had violent clashes with the police. They're a very, very small number and do not represent British or German Muslims. But uh, they do need to be de-radicalized quickly. Otherwise, I fear we could see the kind of Woolwich attack happening in Germany and other parts of Europe. Well, I mean, that's a big fear well, here too, I, isn't it? Well, I think actually what has changed, of course, is that uh, is, uh, in, in, in some of the countries, not at the moment in, in, in Germany, and therefore it might be rather calm here, is that the unemployment has been risen. I mean, I remember uh, after the Second World War in, in the 60s, um, I, I have a colleague who's, uh, who's from Turkey, and she told me her father came to Germany with a train, and he entered Cologne, and there was uh, music on 
on the, on the platform and they were, you know, greeted as, we need you as workers. Yeah, as a guest worker, yeah. As a guest mm -hmm. worker. And uh, definitely a different culture we had. Now, as unemployment rises, right. is, and, and it had been in Germany 10 years ago, it's now in the southern part There's of no Europe. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, That's but what people think. Yeah. I, I, I think it is underlying the, uh, is, is of course, our, our, our society, which does not give work enough to, to these people. Mm -hmm. And they are the first who, who, are, who are losing their jobs. And, and that's part of the problem, I yeah. guess. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're frustrated. We, we need, right. unfortunately, we need to move on. But before we move on, um, you saw, when you talk to um, young Muslims who do have these extremist beliefs and ideas, um, do you have a connection with them that the rest of us would not have? I mean, do you have a credibility with them that is stronger? Are you able to break inside their minds and affect change? It's actually quite difficult. I have some credibility because of my own background. Right. But uh, many of them think uh, if you speak against extremism, you're a sellout, for example, and they, they will just um, close their eyes and, uh, and shut their ears, basically, and not listen. Uh, mm. What we're trying to do is spread ideas, counter-narratives, so there are people between me and them in terms of age and uh, position along the path who, who get the ideas there. But it, it is ultimately a question of ideas. And we have to challenge extremist ideas with inclusive democratic ideas and show people very clearly that their interpretation of Islam is completely wrong and they must integrate uh, better into Western societies if, if they want to live here. Yeah, um, we certainly hope that's going to happen. Um, we need to move on now and move um, from religion to something that um, people like to talk about even more, and that is taxes. Um, when Cyprus was granted a bailout from the European Union, you may remember that, that happened this year, it came with the condition that the island's banking sector be overhauled. Now, that meant an end to the offshore tax haven that the wealthy people of, of the world enjoyed with their Cypriot bank accounts. Cyprus is a small part of a much larger campaign in Europe to make people and businesses tell the truth about what they owe in taxes and to close the loopholes that corporations use to avoid taxes altogether. It is a fight that is being waged on both sides of the Atlantic. Your right hand. In the U.S., Apple executives were hauled in front of a Senate committee. An investigation had found it had avoided paying billions in taxes by using offshore companies. But Apple wasn't apologizing. We not only comply with the laws, but we comply with the spirit of the laws. We don't depend on tax gimmicks. So that the profit... Apple is not the only company under fire. In the UK, Google's been accused of being evil and using smoke and mirrors to avoid taxes. And Starbucks volunteered to pay more than 20 million of extra taxes after uproar about its low tax bill. There have been tough words from EU leaders about closing tax loopholes. But is it governments and not companies that are to blame for tax avoidance? Yeah, that's the big question, isn't it, Mr. Gampka? Are the politicians the blame for all of this tax avoidance that's going on? Well, I think uh, politicians have to act. I mean, uh, companies are doing what the legal systems allow them to do. And uh, I think globalization did change uh, the, the playing field, so mm -hmm. to speak. And uh, what we have, as politicians have to do, to, we have to look for an equal level playing field for, for companies to work. But an equal level playing field would be the same corporate tax rate around the world. Well, That's not going to happen. No, that wouldn't happen. I mean, but, uh, and, and, and I, I should say, if, if uh, Singapore offers a nine years paid a pioneer status where there's zero corporate tax, that's their, their way uh, to attract people. But the issue would be if then German or other countries, uh, companies would transfer businesses into Singapore just to make use of the, the tax uh, uh, or low corporate tax. Yeah. So if, if they say we need, as the company I worked for for 25 years, uh, we said we need to go to Asia and because it's a huge market, 
And so we started a business in Singapore, that's all correct. But then, if I then try to transfer, so to speak, uh, profits from Germany to, to Singapore, that wouldn't be okay. Okay, but what, what do you think the chances are? I mean, it's like I said earlier, it's wishful thinking that you're going to get a harmonization of tax rates in, in the European Union or the yeah. Eurozone. Or is the Eurozone crisis eventually going to give you exactly what you want? Well, I think we have... A, to make a difference between the Eurozone and, you know, the global setup. Within the Eurozone, because we have one currency, we need to have kind of uh, an arrangement concerning corporate taxes, for instance. We are working since 10 years, actually, on the consolidated on. corporate tax. Right. The most important thing, by the way, would be to have the same rules for showing your profits. That is, um, that we can compare really what is happening in France and Germany and what are the profits and et, et cetera. So I think transparency is actually the most important issue which we have to solve. By the way, our, our party in, in introduced a country by country reporting mm -hmm. um, I read about uh, that, yeah. law because as if you know what companies do, I think the pressure, like on Starbucks, you had that in your introduction, mm -hmm. uh, was so big that Starbucks, you know, agreed in paying tax in the UK, although they might say, I'm legally not really forced to have to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that is the more realistic option, yes. isn't it, is to have legislation passed yeah. that requires um, this reporting. Uh, but, you know, the notion of getting harmonization of, of, of tax rates, you know, we've been hearing about that for decades in Europe. Yeah. Um, and we're no closer today than where we were 10 years ago, right? Yes, we are closer. Um, I mean, if it comes to be a bit more to the awareness of people that we have these license havens in, in the Netherlands, the, the, um, uh, we have the situation in the state of Delaware, I mean, Delaware is, is a, a similar, tax haven right. where Cyprus learned how to do it. Right. So I think if that comes more to the, to, to, to the awareness of people and the public, I think countries, uh, nations are, are, are forced really to change. I'm not saying the corporate tax should be uh, even at, 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 at any place, but there should be a corridor which should be, you know... Let me ask someone at this table who actually gets to vote here, yeah. and that's, that's um, Tillman. Um, do you feel like the politicians have let uh, consumers down with the way the tax system is? Is the tax system set up for big companies and created by lobbyists for those big companies? Sometimes it appears like that. Um, we have a tax system, especially if you see the different tax rates in Europe. Um, I'm totally on your side. I, I'm wondering why it is still like that. Um, and I see that I'm always asking myself why these big companies are not seeing what they get from the state as well, uh, which is infrastructure, which is uh, a good educated people at the best. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why, why there is no harder regulation of that. Yeah, I, I mean, we talk about taxes all the time. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the certain things in life. You're, you're going to die and you have to pay taxes. So it's, it's something that seems bad. But a lot of economists have been writing um, since last week, since we had this um, hearing um, in Washington um, on corporate taxes. They've been writing about the good things about taxes. Um, that taxes give us the entire infrastructure that we enjoy, that you know, the rest of the world looks at in envy. Um, but why do the politicians, they, they don't communicate that very well, do they? I mean, do, do you think um, politicians give voters the, the two things? This, this, that, they're, that they're being responsible with the way that companies are taxed? And do you think they give the feeling that they're getting something for the, for the taxes that they're paying in. Well, that's that's I think the the, the difference uh, side of 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 a story that is that in in various countries we have certain levels of how much the the, the people are are giving to the to the government to organize infrastructure. In Scandinavia, the level, so to speak, is higher than in other countries. Right. They, they organize more from, from uh, schools to, I, I, I don't know. And, and so I think we, we, we should not actually influence the level of each country 
where citizens desi decide which is a, the, the, the level, so to speak, of infrastructure I want to have. Surely we need, we have a paradigm change or need one that we should pay for the infrastructure we want. If I want to have schools and policies, police, etc., etc. I need to pay for it. And one of, of, of the situation, or the, the most important change we need, that is we shall not anymore pay for these infrastructure by, by increasing our debt. Okay, I mean, that's one point. I know you don't, you don't want to have um, deficit spending here. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's also pathetic, isn't it, when the state ha is home to all of these international companies and they're making profits like crazy, and you can't afford to pay your police officers a decent wage. I mean, there's something wrong in the, co in the collection of those taxes, for, for one. Um, do you think, though, Mr. Gomka, I'll come back to this Eurozone crisis story yep. again. You're a politician. You know how angry the Germans get every time they're reminded that they're having to finance all of these bailouts in the Eurozone. Yep. Isn't this anger eventually going to force the Eurozone to a point where the, the ultimatum is delivered? Either everyone is on the same page tax-wise, 